In March 1943, amidst the Pacific War's relentless fury and recent Allied triumphs, a Japanese commanding officer aboard the Yukikaze sailed through the Bismarck Sea. They protected a convoy of eight transport ships, crucial for the Japanese war effort against the advancing Allies on New Guinea. Then, he noticed a B-24 bomber flying in the distance. He knew they had been sighted. Soon after, B-17s and B-24 bombers, dozens of them, appeared on the horizon. On all Japanese destroyers, sailors frantically secured loose equipment and fastened hatches. Clattering footsteps reverberated on the metal decks as gun crews swiftly loaded and checked ammunition. The Japanese fleet would soon be embroiled in intense combat, facing off against numerous bombers and fighter aircraft in the Battle of the Bismarck Sea. Following the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, the Pacific War entered a new and intense phase. The swift and coordinated assault by the Japanese Imperial forces caught the United States off guard, resulting in significant damage to the Pacific Fleet. In the months that followed, Japan expanded its territorial gains, capturing the Philippines, Hong Kong, Guam, and numerous other strategic locations throughout Southeast Asia and the Pacific. The Imperial Japanese Navy seemed unstoppable as they pursued their objective of establishing a defensive perimeter to protect their newly acquired territories. However, the turning point came in June 1942 with the Battle of Midway. The United States, having broken Japanese naval codes, anticipated the Japanese plan to seize Midway Atoll and dealt a decisive blow to the Imperial Navy. Japanese fortunes reversed. The Allies counterattacked, regaining control of important locations like Guadalcanal and New Guinea. Suddenly, Japan was on the defensive. Following Midway, the Allies determined to seize the strategic initiative in the Pacific, launched a series of counteroffensives. In August 1942, the United States and its allies initiated the Solomon Campaign by landing on Guadalcanal. Simultaneously, Australian and American forces in New Guinea repelled the Japanese land offensive along the challenging Kokoda Track. The Allies, gaining momentum, went on the offensive and successfully captured the southeast, decisively defeating Japanese forces in that area. The Allied forces, recognizing the importance of neutralizing the main Japanese base at Rabaul on New Britain, pursued Operation Cartwheel, an overarching strategy aimed at clearing the path for the eventual reconquest of the Philippines. The security of Japan's outer defensive perimeter hinged on retaining control of northern New Guinea as its fall would expose vital oil fields and rubber plantations in the Dutch East Indies to potential Allied bombing. Furthermore, the Philippines would be at risk of reoccupation, isolating the Japanese home islands from essential East Indies resources, the Allies had already attempted several times to disrupt Japanese supply convoys to New Guinea. Uncoordinated Air Force squadrons yielded limited success. Seeking improvement, General George Kenney, commander of the Allied Air Forces, turned to Major Paul Pappy Gunn. Gunn ingeniously transformed B-25s into potent commerce destroyers, enhancing their firepower. Concurrently, skip bombing experiments and low-altitude maneuvers were conducted proving effective, especially in twin-engined aircraft. Recognizing this, Kenny directed bombers to practice skip and mast-top bombing. By February 1943, pilots had honed these techniques, achieving increased accuracy. Crews flying B-25s were meticulously selected and underwent rigorous training, adapting to evolving requirements. Comprising pilots, navigators, bombardiers, radio operators, flight engineers, aerial gunners, and cannoneers, the crews played a crucial role in the success of subsequent operations. Meanwhile, the Allied objective was to capture the Japanese port stronghold at Salamaua, threatening the administrative headquarters at Lei and potentially turning its facilities against Japanese forces in New Britain. In response, Japan aimed to force the Allies back across the Owen Stanley Range, complicating their supply efforts. To reinforce their position, Generals Imamura and Adachi planned a convoy from Rabaul to Lee, set to arrive by the end of February, escorting Lieutenant General Nakano Hidemitsu's 51st Division. The convoy, consisting of eight transports and eight destroyers, commanded by Rear Admiral Kimura Masatomi, intended to take a route along the northern coast 
to evade Allied reconnaissance. They departed on February 28th. Decoded Japanese messages gave the Allies a month's warning about this convoy. Intense training and rehearsals followed, with B-25 pilots preparing for very low-level attacks. However, the convoy's last-minute rerouting to the north of New Britain posed challenges due to bad weather. On March 1st, Lieutenant Walter Higgins finally located the convoy, but unfavorable conditions prevented immediate attacks. To prepare, six Australian A-20 Bostons attacked Ley to prevent the Japanese station there from supporting the approaching convoy. The next day, March 2nd, a B-24 located the convoy at the entrance to the Dampier Strait, but cloud cover obscured some ships. The Japanese convoy designated the 8 Transport Fleet, comprising six troop ships, one transport for aviation fuel, Kembu Maru, and a special service vessel, Nojima, was escorted by Destroyer Squadron 3, with Yukikaze and Tokitsukaze carrying Lieutenant General Nakano and Adachi. With the convoy now in range, eight B-17s approached, followed by 21 more bombers, four B-17s and 17 B-24s. Despite a planned escort of P-38 Lightning fighters, they failed to rendezvous with the first flight of bombers. The first B-17 wave, flying at 6,500 feet, launched their attack. Bombs dropped among the convoy as the Japanese machine gunners frantically attempted to shoot down the aircraft. The B-17s claimed hits on two transports, including the Kyokusai Maru. The second wave reported damage to four cargo ships, reportedly leaving them burning. Though the actual impact was less than claimed, Kyokusai Maru sank and other vessels, including Nojima and Teyo Maru, sustained damage but remained operational. The US encountered minimal opposition from anti-aircraft fire. The 850 troops from Kyokusi Maru lost weapons and equipment, as the Asagumo and Yukikaze rescued most, if not all, of them. While the Allies believed they had sunk nine transports, in fact, the Japanese had lost just one maintaining the convoy's ability to deliver reinforcements with a lower than expected loss rate. As night fell, both sides prepared for the inevitable attack the following day, as Australian PBY aircraft shadowed the convoy throughout the night. As dawn broke on March 3, 1943, the Japanese convoy entered the Vitiaz Strait. The convoy now entered the striking range of the US and Australian medium bombers, the Allied forces orchestrated a comprehensive assault, utilizing a variety of aircraft to maximize their impact. The initial attack featured torpedo-carrying Beauforts. By 4 a.m., eight planes left their base at Milne, though only two planes reached the convoy. While they flew north, another squadron of Australian A-20s bombed Leahy once again to prevent them from sending reinforcements to the convoy. The Beauforts approached their target at a height level with the masthead. While their torpedoes missed their targets, the Beauforts successfully conditioned the Japanese to perceive mast top attacks as potential torpedo runs. Shortly after, bow fighters and B-17s joined the fray. In total, this squadron likely numbered nearly 100 aircraft. The bow fighters, armed with four 20mm cannons in the nose and six wing-mounted machine guns, executed a mast top sweep. Masatomi, expecting another torpedo attack, ordered his ships to rapidly turn towards the approaching aircraft. When facing the aircraft vertically, the torpedoes would have little surface to impact. However, these aircraft did not launch torpedoes, and the vertical alignment provided ideal for strafing. Although they lacked the armor-penetrating power of larger rounds, Bowfighter's explosive shells wreaked havoc on unarmored targets scattering crews and inducing chaos aboard the Japanese vessels. A handful of Japanese Mitsubishi Zeros attempted to fight off the Allied forces, but they were vastly outnumbered. Masatomi's flagship, the Shirayuki, was severely damaged by machine gun strafing from the bow fighters, with a salvo killing most officers on the bridge. Following the bow fighters, B-17s carried out bombing runs from medium altitudes, aiming to disrupt and disperse the convoy. Their efforts were followed by B-25Cs, making standard medium-level attacks. However, none of these rounds achieved direct hits on the ships. 
The turning point of the battle came with the arrival of strafer-equipped B-25s from the 90th Bomb Squadron. Sweeping in at a low altitude of 500 feet, flying in pairs, these aircraft targeted individual vessels that misled by the initial torpedo feint exposed their decks for prolonged periods. Exploiting the confusion, the strafers unleashed devastating fire from eight machine guns, achieving remarkable success. This multi-pronged assault led to the effective disruption and scattering of the Japanese convoy, leaving individual ships vulnerable to strafers and masthead bombers. The timing of the attack was impeccable, catching the convoy without adequate air cover. After the initial strike, the majority of Japanese ships were sunk, sinking, or heavily damaged, including all seven transport vessels. Masatomi's flagship was then bombed by several bombers, causing the entire ship to blow up. Despite the massive explosion, Masatomi survived and was picked up by another destroyer. In the afternoon, Allied air power returned to finish the job. B-17s and B-25s targeted the remaining Japanese ships, once again inflicting enormous damage. The bombing raid proved the nail in the coffin for the Japanese. Among those hit was the destroyer Arashio. After being bombed, she became rudderless and steered straight into a disabled supply ship. Listing heavily, her crew abandoned her. The Tokitsukaze was sunk as well after multiple bombs. The Japanese aerial support, a squadron of Mitsubishi Zeros, arrived too late to be of any help. They launched a chase of the B-17s and P-38s flying around. However, they were unable to catch up with them, although some sources indicate occasional dogfights did ensue. Meanwhile, surviving Japanese destroyers rapidly began fishing survivors out of the water. The remaining destroyers, including Uranami, Shikinami, Asagumo, and Yukikaze, rescued hundreds of soldiers and sailors from the water rapidly retreating up the Vityaz Strait at more than 20 knots. Asashio stayed behind to assist the crippled Arashio. Meanwhile, Allied aircraft were swiftly rearmed and refueled at Port Moresby, with the bombers heading out again to begin their mop-up operation. Weather complications over the Owen Stanley range limited most fighters. Only a few bombers accompanied by five Bostons crossed the range. The afternoon assaults were a chaotic combination of medium-altitude bombings and low-level skip bombing runs. Eight strafer B-25s achieved four hits each on two destroyers. Another 15 bombers, attacking from both medium and low altitudes, claimed 10 more hits. Despite the initial prompt rescue operation, the day's toll for the Japanese was severe. With eight transports and three destroyers sunk, only four Japanese destroyers managed to escape, each having pulled hundreds of survivors on board. Allied aircrew claimed they shot down up to 20 Japanese fighter planes. Initial estimates of Japanese casualties, widely reported in the media, claimed 15,000 losses. However, post-battle intelligence revealed a much lower figure, with reports suggesting 2,890 to 6,912 Japanese casualties. The figure of 20 aerial victories was under scrutiny as well, and more realistically it was a fraction of this number. Despite the discrepancy, General Kenny and General MacArthur refused to revise their claims. Kenny even took action against those questioning the assessment, and accusations surfaced about the suppression of evidence indicating lower Japanese losses. At best, only 820 survivors made it to Leh, stripped of equipment, supplies, and weapons. General Kenny's directive to show no quarter resulted in many Japanese casualties. After refueling in Port Moresby, Allied crews returned to engage in strafing Japanese survivors as part of what they deemed military necessity. Reports detailing these actions were matter of fact, with air crews describing the destruction of lifeboats and the incapacitation of survivors. The Allies, in contrast, had minimal losses, with two B-17s and three P-38s lost. No B-25s were shot down. Only 13 aircrew members lost their lives. The Battle of the Bismarck Sea marked a decisive victory for the Allies. The 5th Air Force embraced the strike bomber concept in April, converting 30 B-25s to strafers and modifying more Glasnose Mitchells. Notably, 126 C models became B-25Gs with enhanced firepower. The Townsville Field Modification Center fortified factory-built B-25Gs, 
while the follow-on B-25H featured a 75mm cannon and eight forward-firing machine guns. B-25s played a vital role in disrupting Rabaul and sinking enemy ships, proving as effective as mass top bombing. Japan, facing adaptability challenges, redirected troop reinforcements through covert routes and attempted to bolster destroyer anti-aircraft capabilities with limited success. Thank you very much for watching this video. Please leave a like, it really helps out the channel. If there is a topic, battle or person you would like to know more about, let me know your thoughts in a comment. I would also like to thank all my patrons and channel members for their generous support. If you enjoy House of History and you want to support my work, consider joining me on Patreon. For just $1 per month, you will already gain early access to all my videos without any in-video advertisements. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.